deals with the doctrine of the Holy Scriptures. All that you will learn about God and about all essential doctrines are found in the Scripture. And it is so because we, because of the integrity of the Scripture and self-authentication of the Scripture, the Scriptures can be trusted. The Scriptures are infallible rule of faith and life. And then we, in uh, chapter 2 of the Confession, we look at the doctrine of, is it God? And it talks about who God is. And it is good that we are now looking at, even at that, in our Sunday school. Uh, please do yourself a great deal of a favor to attend the Sunday school 9 a.m. on Sundays. It will help you to even understand more about the nature of God, his character, his attributes, and his relationship with us. But, uh, then we are in chapter 3. And the subject that chapter 3 concerns itself with is on the decrees of God, or God decrees, the things that God decrees. Uh, decree is a uh, law that does have in it uh, the measure of irrevocability or, or, or unchangeableness. So we'll be looking at the first paragraph or the first shadow of chapter 3 in the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith known as the 1689 uh, Confession of Faith. And I think I did... Uh, some part in paragraph one, and Brother Elias I finished up paragraph one last week Tuesday. Is there any question that uh, is still lingering upon your heart from uh, that from that subject last week? I think the highlight of paragraph one is God decrees all that God decrees in Himself all that will happen, and this decree. Uh, is, 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 is total and all encompass, encompassing, particularly decree over good and evil, Isaiah 45, decrees even around the sinful acts of men. Uh, number three, decrees around the free acts of men. Number four, God decrees affects even chance and occurrences. Number five, God decrees affects even death of our lives, of course. And number six, God decrees affects affairs of nations. All the nations of the earth and their affairs are directed and even decreed by God, whether it's an Islamic nation or whatever nations may call um, under the authority of God, Second King chapter five, uh, and the final destruction of the way of, of the world, uh, God decrees is all uh, encompassing. Okay, if there are no serious uh, issues from last week, may we proceed to second paragraph of the Confession, chapter three, and this is one of the sh this, this is very short. Um, maybe less controversial. So let's do that one. From next week, we we'll get into the decrees of 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 uh, of predestination, predestination, and the decree of reprobation. Yeah, that God decrees some angels to some men and angels to hell. What do call it? Double? Is it double? Uh, hmm? Double double predestination. Yeah, that is more more tougher. But when you're coming next week, buy a bottle of Coke and some granules. And, uh, and, but make sure you read around it. And, uh, but let's look at the second paragraph of, uh, of chapter 3 of uh, 1689. Although God knoweth whatsoever may or come to pass, Upon all supposed conditions, yet he had not decreed anything because he foresaw it as future, or as that which would come to pass upon such conditions. Now, what I've just read now is like jargons, no? 
let me calm down and read it again. Like, nobody calm down. Although, God knows. I think, are you carrying the modern uh, rendition? Okay, let me, can you read it? Modern English, yeah? God's degree, God's decree is not based upon his foreknowledge that under certain conditions, certain happenings will likely take place, but is independent of all such foreknowledge. Yeah. So, God, God's decree is not based on his foreknowledge. It's not just the decree of God is not because he merely know what will happen. Because many of you will not argue with foreknowledge. Of course, it's God. You should know whatever uh, may happen or will happen. The ground for his foreknowledge is not, is not dependent on events that may occur. God himself is the ground for his foreknowledge. Let me read uh, a particular quote, and then I'll read some scriptures, we'll read some scriptures to support the idea. And he said, God knoweth whatsoever may come to pass. God knoweth whatsoever may or can come to pass. He does not merely know what is going to come to pass, but what may come to pass. He does not merely know the actual, but also the plausible. If the circumstances were different whatsoever the supposed uh, conditions will be. God decrees all things in himself. That is what paragraph one says. God decrees all things in himself. And this means that he had not decreed anything because he foresaw it as future. His decree grounds the future and gives shape to the future. God is not influenced by things not yet existed or have not been decreed. The only thing that God is influenced by is himself. God is not influenced by, by the future. God is influenced by himself. Okay. First Samuel chapter 23. We can keep one microphone at the back and one here in the front so that anyone that found the passages can read. First Samuel chapter 23. Verse 11 to 12. Anyone? This is David uh, asking God, making inquiry about uh, what may happen to him when he was running away from Saul. Adora, sit down. Hmm? And don't stand up again. Okay, that's David asking God what could or may happen to him. And this, this uh, is God's uh, response. Who is in that place? Verse 11. Will the men of Kila surrender me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord, the God of Israel, please tell your servant. And the Lord said he will come down. Then David said, will the men of Kila Surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul. And the Lord said, they will surrender you. Yeah. So this is David. Uh, David was running away from Saul, and then he came to Kelia. He has done something favorable to this city before, and he heard this, 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 uh, a leak uh, intel to Saul that David is at this location. And David heard that Saul was coming down. So he asked God, whether David uh, Saul will come. And God told him Saul will come. He also asked God if the people of that city will betray him. And God said they will betray him. The reason why this passage is supporting this is that God knows, God knows even the plausible, not just both the plausible and the actual. God knows. And the argument is that at, at, at which point, at what point did God come to? Is it that God sat in heaven and then foresaw these events 
and then knows it. He saw this man behaving uh, in the future. And then he aligns his own knowledge to the behavior of these people in the future. And the idea, looking at the nature and the character of God is, no, it is God himself grounds his foreknowledge. God is a, Because before anything ever existed, God was. So there is no way there are things that have not yet taken place will inform God why they have not yet taken place. It means that God not just know what will happen, but he, he, he ordains all those things to happen. And don't forget, God ordains both the ends and the means. Okay? And some of the reasons why God, because the question may ask, that, why should God ordain some stupid things like this? Well, there are some hidden will of God that we don't know why he permits some things to happen. But this event here was in the sovereign counsel of God. Matthew chapter 11, verse 21. We are looking at God knowing whatever may come to pass upon all supposed conditions. Matthew 11, verse 21 to 23. Matthew 11, 21 to 23. Anyone can read. Woe yes, to you. Uh, yes uh, Felix. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Is it, show, is it, is it Chorazin? Or co, co, is it co, co? It's, it's like, it's not sure and it's not co. It is... Yes, I got right. Okay. Yeah, from there. Chorazin. Yes. Go Woe ahead. to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you and ha- had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades, for if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. Amen. So God knows what will happen if the city of Chorazin and Bethsaida responded in a particular way. He also knows what could have happened if the preaching and the works that took place in Tyre and Sidon, uh, no, uh, that took place, um, I told you, uh, yeah, it, the word that, they, that took place in the side that happened in Tyre and Sidon, God knew what Tyre and Sidon have done. God also knew what Sodom, and, by this time, Sodom and Gomorrah was how many years? Maybe almost 4,000 years behind history. And God knew what Sodom and Gomorrah would have, would have done if, if Christ was in their day preaching and working among them. But much more than that, God even knows what will happen on the last day concerning these people. That on the last day, people, is not, people, <laughs> people it will be better for Sodom and Gomorrah than them uh, on the last day. So God knows what, what, what could have, may have happened way back. God also knows what happened and what happened in the future. Much more than knowing. The idea here is that it's not just merely knowing it. He knows the actual and the plausible. Acts chapter 15, verse 18. Of old. Known from all. <laughs> yeah, if you read 17, it gives, it gives you the context that God knows everything from of old. And, and the idea of knowledge here, uh, without, I don't want to bore you with uh, biblical languages. But the idea of known, both in, in the Greek and the Hebrew, sometimes is much more than the English word know. Like know by learning or learning by like, you, you know things because you learn. But knowledge is not just when it, when, it, when it has to do with God. God does not learn anything, as we are going to see. 
we know because it comes, it, the things come to our awareness. We learn along the way. God does not acquire new knowledge. Because God himself is the fountain of all knowledge. So we have looked at the scripture supporting the first parts of the paragraph. Although God knoweth whatever may come to pass upon all supposed conditions. The second part is that yet he had not decreed anything because he foresaw it as future or as that which would come to pass upon such conditions. Isaiah 40 verse 13 to 14. See, there's a microphone at the back. So this other part now, let people from the back, the, the David, Ima, Eleazar cycle, the Ben cycle, Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13 to 14. Thirteen and fourteen years. Anyone? Okay. Isaiah forty thirteen. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord, or what man shows him his counsel? Fourteen. Whom did he consult, and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice, and taught him knowledge, and showed him the way of understanding? Yeah. Powerful. I mean. God does not go to any, any school to learn. Oh, eh? is that how your Bible be? Okay. Oh, is that how your Bible be? Okay. Oh. oh, CG and design. Okay. Oh, okay. We now know. No, nobody informs God. Okay. Uh, Romans chapter 9, verse 11 to 18. God. <laughs> does not decree anything because he foresaw it as future. Romans chapter 9, verse 11 to 18. A good reader. It's a long passage, but let someone read it clearly. 11 to 18. Romans chapter 9, from verse 11 to verse 18. Though they were not yet born and had done nothing... This is talking about Jacob and Esau. Yeah. When they were in their mother's womb. Continue. In order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. 14. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Hmm. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then, he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Amen. Turn to chapter 11 of Romans, verse 34. And you can even lead up to 36. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his, his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Yes. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. First Corinthians 2, verse 16. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Amen. These scriptures are the scripture attached to the second paragraph. 
Now let's get to the business of understanding this more clearly. What the confession is saying is that God decreed all things. Now, it is not your business to know the reason why. Why he decreed things to happen other than the one which he has revealed to us. There are some things that God uh, decreed that the scripture gives us explanation as to why God decreed them. The reason why he allowed his son to go to the cross is redemption. Yeah. So, but do we? But there are some things that we don't really know why God uh, 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 ordains them to happen the way they ordain. What the confession says is that God ordains all things and He decrees all things. And this decree is not based on what He foresaw. He is the ground of His own foreknowledge. He is the one that gives shape and direction to the future. The future, both actual and possible, are in the hand of God. He's the one detecting every moment of history. Nothing is happening that God has not ordained. If there is anything that happens outside the ordination of God, outside the decrees of God, that thing becomes another entity outside the circumference of the controls or the sovereignty of God. That is what the confession is trying to say. Now, this confession, as I, I used to take you a little bit backward to church history, this confession did not happen in a vacuum. Who can tell me what, what heresy, what the church called heresy, what heresy do you think chapter 2 was written to target, to kill or to haunt. Arminianism. What is Arminianism? Anyone? Verma? Anyone? Arminianism. There are many definitions. It's broadly known to be a Doctrine opposing Calvin's theology on the sovereignty of God. Sorry, I didn't hear that. The doctrine of what? There are many definitions, but it's broadly known to be um, a set of doctrines made by the disciples of Arminians mm -hmm. opposing the doctrines of Calvin. They brought up five points, which are refuted later on. Okay. But mostly at the core of it is their doctrine centered around man and not on God. Yeah, in, in you, are, you are around the very fairy of the issue. You, 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 you are missing some point, but, but yeah, you are just around the house. Yeah, who else can attempt? Uh, Eric? Okay, um, Aminianism uh, um, believes that man chooses God no, man chooses God. Is it man chooses? Okay, no, just that, finish your thoughts. Okay, yeah. as, as as regards to I mean, as regards to salvation, okay. man chooses God, and that um, God is not God is not like just like we believe that um, you are God's elect, and if you preach the gospel to you, you believe. But in their own from their own um, view. When we preach the gospel, you choose if you want to. So man's free will is placed over. Now you are hitting it free will. Very well. The 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 point of Arminianism is the issue of how do we reconcile free will with God's sovereignty. And Arminianism was a debate that was prevalent in in Holland, in Dutch. Holland. When? Is this 16th century, 17th, 18th? There were disciples, there are some guys that were looking at what the disciples of John Calvin were teaching. Give me your ears, man, because history always repeats itself. Nothing is new. Because the modern version of Arminianism is worse. Of course, I mean, there's still Arminianism. Arminianism is still around. Many churches will call themselves Arminian. 
whatever. But what is the current, the contemporary version of Arminianism worldwide um, among the theolo uh, theological schools? I've mentioned that before. No, not Pentecostalism. Yeah, no. Huh? Liberalism? No, not liberal theology. Legalism. No, legalism is, an, is a concept. It's called open theism. Open theism. Or the openness of God. So, the, this guy, and I want you to understand because sometimes they say, I'm a Calvinist, I'm a Arminianist. You don't really understand what was happening. These things were not happening in a vacuum. It happens within the social, social political uh, uh, issues around Europe, the larger Europe. It's not like now that you can sit comfortably in this hall and say, I'm a Calvinist. And then I can choose to stand up and say, I'm an Arminian. It's okay. We shake hands, we drink tea. It's a matter of life and death. If you're a Calvinist at this point, the, the Calvinists, through the influence of Geneva, was much more stronger. They were in government. The Armenians, it, in fact, both Armenian and Calvinist could look like APC and PDP. If you belong to, belongs to this, it, because the Calvinists, were magisterial, most of the Calvinists were magisterial reformers. What it means that they, 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 they see the connection between the state and the church. The state is the church and the church is the state. Most of the Armenians were more of Anabaptists. They, they saw the clear distinction between the state and the church. And the fear of the Calvinists at that time was that the Armenians tend to lean was Roman Catholicism, and by this time, Roman Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church has been almost defeated from Europe, from the larger, from the continental Europe. So the issue came to the head when the Armenians, what they call the, the, the Remonstrants, wrote five points of Arminianism to defend their point, and then a synod was called so that both parties could harmonize their differences. In fact, there was, it was the Armenians that were fighting. And then the, 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 the Dutch church now called, is called for a synod. What is a synod? Like a council, like a conference. So from Great Britain, from Switzerland, from Sweden, and from France, they came together, the bishops. And guess what happened? The Armenians were not given a seat I mean, how do you reconcile differences when your opponent was not allowed to even come in? So they, they gave them three seats. Later, they were ejected out of the hall. So they spent six months talking to themselves. And at the end of the six months, Arminianism was termed as heresy. In fact, one of the military generals that was supporting Arminian at the beginning of the synod was arrested and were placed uh, in, in, uh, in, in confinement. At the end of this council, he was beheaded. So church history is, is a very messy. This, 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 what we are talking here, laughing, somebody was beheaded. <laughs> 200 Armenian pastors lost their job immediately. They could no longer pastor. They could no longer work. It took some years before some toleration uh, happened. So if you are an Armenian pastor at that time, you can't pastor any parish. You can't do anything. Uh, the Calvinists won the day. Okay, that is just it. But what is the first point of Armenianism? The first point of Arminianism is that election was conditional in foreseen faith. That's the first point of Arminianism, that all of you believe in election. God elected us before the foundation of the world eh? in himself. Arminianism is saying that God, in eternity past, saw that fire came is going to believe, saw her faith, and on the basis of of what God foresaw, he decreed and elected you for salvation. Do you understand that thing? Do you understand this argument? That it's not that God on, your, on his own, before you were formed, chose you. It's that God foresaw that you are going to be a good man. That you will be listening to him. 
on the basis of what he foresaw, he make his decree. How do I, for instance, if I can look into the crystal ball and saw that David, my David here is going to be the governor of uh, Ocean States in, the, in 2027, what am I supposed to be doing today? Hmm? And I'm so sure the, the oracle t- just was so clear that David in the next seven years will be a governor. What should be my attitude around him? Ah, you mean friend? David, can I wash your car for you? Huh? In fact, by next Sunday, say the Lord told me he's the new elder of this church. <laughs> I, I would say, David, I mean, oh, come on, come on. Uh, it's like, oh, because I have seen. On the other hand, if I notice that Ima, God forbid, is going to be a schismatic in three years' time. That he will take half of this church and go and plant another church in the What am I supposed to be doing to him now? So, if, if I foresaw, even this, the country from one party to another, is this what is the foreknowledge? For you, are, you are looking, you are projecting, you are looking, and you are making permutations. And based on your permutations, you are making plans. You are making, it's like contingencies. That's, that's the first point. Because some of you, some of you don't have sympathy for Arminianism because you have not read the details. They are saying that God made plans based on contingencies. And our forefathers say, no, God made decrees in himself. The modern day of open theism of this of this Armenian is called open theism. And what they are saying is that God, and it's still the people are still struggling to explain foreknowledge. And what they are saying is, what they are saying is, God, as a sovereign ruler, as a sovereign creator, sovereignly bound himself to some certain limitations. That is, it is still consistent. With sovereignty. To say, okay, I am God, I limit myself to, this is my extent. That extent was not placed on God by external forces. But in the, in the decretals of God, he has made himself vulnerable. That is the word. He has made himself vulnerable. So that there are some certain things he refused, that he do, there are some certain things that he does not know. So he, he, he allowed the future to be open. That God also learn along the way and make some certain adjustments. Are you following the argument? Let me read some of their text. Genesis 6 verse 6. Come to Genesis verse 6. Genesis 6 verse 6. Quickly. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him to his heart. Do you regret if you know something? Eh? That is, if you actually understand what regret <laughs> is all about. Another scripture, the approved text, is Genesis 22, verse 12. And I think that is Isaac and Abraham, yeah? When God now said, now I know. Yeah? He said, mm-hmm. do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing yeah. that you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Yeah. So God, God doesn't really know until Mount Moriah. And God said, yeah. So they were just watching to see what Abraham would do. And I mean that your pastors preach that in this country. And as Abraham just said, are you serious? And then God said, Angel, come on, can you see what he's doing? Wow. And then they said, no, 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 no. Oh, now we know. Oh, now we know we didn't make it. Why would we choose you? We're not too sure. But now that you are doing this thing, you are fine. Exodus 32 verse 14. What was that place? And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of yeah. bringing on his people. So he was going to do something 
and then he will not do it again. And that's also connected with Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. When God now, are you following the whole argument now? So this, these are the scriptures, nothing more. This is the entire open theism. This is the anchor scriptures that they will write volumes and volumes of books of God. And they will neglect other scriptures. Now, as a Bible student, what you are going to do is that when, when you are reading all of these uh, passages, and then you are reading the other passages I've read before. If you are not a serious Christian, you are going to fall into the temptation in agreeing that the scripture does con- contain inconsistency and contradictions, isn't it? That's where Bible study is quite key, so that you look at how this thing coheres. Because scripture, the Bible is coherent in what it teaches. Okay. So what the confession is saying is the future is not open. God ordains the future. He controls and gives shape to the future. What will happen, what may happen, all are in the hands of God. And if you remember what the, the other paragraph said, and it said, even at, at that, the will of the creature is not violated. Hmm? And the space for contingency, or the second, what they call the second, uh, second causes, is not also violated. Is that God ordains the end, also ordains the means, how those things will pan out. That is what the confession is saying in second paragraph, uh, chapter 3. Of the second London Baptist Confession of Faith. Amen. Now, before I come to the point of application, any stone at me. No, not at me. Any stone at the scriptures. Any question? That's what I want. You, Eliza. Okay. I, I, I'm comfortable with any question. I don't have trouble. Let me raise that too. Let me know who want to, who want to ask question. Okay, Eliezer, please. Um, so my, my question is, how then do we understand those texts that says God regretted? Now we know from the other passages of scripture that God cannot regret because God does not learn anything in time. The knowledge of God is eternal. The decree of God is eternal. We know that in time, God does not operate in time. His knowledge is not based on time. It's not based on succession of events. But how do we how do we understand those? What was actually happening? Was it that it happened that God expressed it that is because he's trying to relate with human beings, or was it how do we how do we how do we explain those scriptures? We want to help this quasi uh, unbeliever. <laughs> Anyone? Any idea? Church? When God said He regretted that He created man, what do you think? What is being expressed there? Yeah? What do you think? Nobody will kill you. Just, just say whatever you want to say. I mean, if, if it's not good, I'll tell you this is rubbish. <laughs> and then you still have yourself intact. <laughs> yes, Ima, can you project your voice a little bit? Hatred for sin. Okay, in my saying, when God said I regretted that I created man, he's showing hatred for sin. Seriously. Seriously. Okay, any other person? Every time, yeah, you're on fire today. Pass the microphone, my lady theology. Okay. Yes? Erica. Okay, I don't know if it's a lomorphism, that's um, Bible um, a bit explanation of God's emotion in terms of in human. Um, them, basically for us to understand, but anthropo, anthropomorphism, uh-huh. anthropo, anthropomorphism, morphism, yes, anthropomorphism, yes, okay, yes, Felix, it's like you raised your mind before. Oh no, I, I just yeah, let me let me just you spoke to add. her. No, 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 okay. <laughs> I just want to add. Okay, something. add. Huh? Okay, um, and also when we look at the passages that. Speak that seem to, that speak opposite of what those texts talk about, the like in the episodes and other passages. Those passages are um, are didactic, uh, are instructive, didactic in nature, where 
they are specific about who God is and is and you also see it even in maybe in Isaiah and about the nature of God, his attributes. But these passages are more like narratives that try to express what she was um, trying to say. Yeah. Trying to, yes. Yes, and, and something that uh, Piper or MacArthur will call holy emotions. You know, we've let, we talk about uh, impass, impassibility of God, that God does not have passion. That should be chapter 2. Chapter 2, yeah? That God is without body, parts, or passion. And what that means is that God is unchanging. Nothing affects him from outside. He is, is self-contained. But in terms of our relationship, in terms of God relating with man, God does express some emotions. But those emotions are not like our own emotions, the way we express our emotions, that if my wife slap me, or my wife prick me, or they refuse to give me food, I act, then I'm well fed, I'm happy. God is not like, like that. He's so stable in his, his emotions. So he has what they call holy anger towards sin, holy jealousy. God loves, God cares. These are, these are emotions, isn't it? So the, the, the language of, of, of Genesis 6 and other passages, as Eric mentioned, is called anthropomorphism, that the Bible narrators are speaking using human, human terms and categories so we can understand. And this, under, and, and, this, and this is not even a sufficient understanding, just like a vague understanding of how the sinfulness, how that's the, wow. the, the gravity of what Adam did, uh, what uh, the fallout of that sin brings upon humanity. Eliza, is that, is that better? Sure. Okay, uh, right, right. Yeah. And you can read a lot of commentaries. There are a lot of commentaries in my office and online. And look at what biblical scholars say about uh, six. And there are some scholars who believe that, yeah, yeah, God doesn't know. When Adam fell, was, and actually God was coming to the garden to meet with Adam. It's like you want to go and see your girlfriend with, 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 with a bouquet. And then you knock on the door. <laughs> and then it's something else. So God was actually coming that day, maybe to eat or to have fellowship with Adam. So Adam, where are you? And he was just the way Eric and is looking for his his wedding ring that fell. And like, oh, where, where? Oh, no. And God, Adam said, We are here. Because you are here. Well, and then Komori goes, oh, What do we do now? And then God is making contingencies, making plans. Okay, if you do, ah, Michael, if you don't send this guy from this garden, oh, they are going to eat this dinner. And then there's panic in heaven. And then God is running around just to save the situation. Okay, son, what do we do? Are you going to die for these people so we can save them? And their son said, Father, let me look. Okay, I will, I will go. They say, and Jamaica, they say, Jamaica, no, me, I cannot go. They say, this and Jamaica. And then son said, Father, if nobody is going, I am going. And God said, my son, you are going. Hmm? And then the son, and then it took many years of 4,000, God, the darling. And then the son now came. And the son was suffering. The father was so mad. I will come and look at the son. Come on, what is happening to my son? And then, Boom. That's not what is happening. Those who think that that's, that is the situation don't really know God. If, if, if there are things that God is not aware of. See, the book, you know, we, we speak like Nigerians. Why do you think Bwari is not performing? What is the normal answer on the street? If you, if, if, I'm not saying he's not performing, no. I'm just saying some people say Bwari is not performing. Okay, why do you think people say if there, if there is if there is this if there is that proposition that is not performing, what's the usual response? The cabals, isn't it? Oh, it's not him, it's the cabal. He doesn't know. If he know, we know body very well. If he know him, God is not like that. The book must stop on one particular table. God who made this world without anybody instigating him. Nobody told him. That there is a need for some planets to be created in and of himself. He made everything. And on his table, all the book stops. Yet he is not the author of sin. What is something? We're echoing some things. Who? Both of them. That there. That's your wife and who? That, and and Fire Kenny. Okay, what are they saying? 
They were saying that what you are saying is exactly what they taught them growing up. <laughs> Let's take them out for baptism, huh? We take them out for second baptism, yeah. The brother Abraham. It's your question now. The Bible teaches that God exists as a triune being. God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. And these three are co-equal, co-eternal, mm-hmm. and co-essence. Mm-hmm. So my question is, that question that was posed to Jesus about the last day, that when will it be? And then he said, I don't know. That he doesn't know. Yeah. That even the angels in heaven don't yeah. know. Yeah. Except the Father. God the Father. So I want you to help me understand that passage better because I mean since you are speaking now like a theologian, coessence, co equal, co eternal, help us. Can you dissect Christology? The nature of Christ. I may not really have much knowledge and in that department. All the big, big <laughs> books that exist about yeah. theology. Yeah, you, you talk about Christ. What is the nature? The, and the all nature that. of Christ. Yeah, that's what the, uh, Christology means. Christ. About the study about Christ. The so, what do you know about Christ in okay. terms of his nature? All right. In terms of in terms of his nature. Yeah. God exists. I mean, Jesus. Mm, Jesus is the God Man, meaning his. Completely God, and then He's completely man. That according is two to natures. Two nature, one being. That is what the Scripture teaches. Good. Yes. And I've mentioned this right from my heart. That Christ is one hundred percent God, one hundred percent man, two natures, one person, two center of consciousness, but not of self consciousness or self awareness. And I, I told you that I'll be repeating this for 10 years before you understand clearly. You see? And it's good to be that up because that's something some people also run there. See, yeah, even Jesus Christ, he doesn't know when he's going to come. Then he, when Christ was here in his humanity, he could not be in Jerusalem at the same time and be in Galilee. Two of us. Two of us. Why? Yes, he was. His, his humanity was genuine. There are some heresies out there, like the Epistle of Barnabas, that teaches that Christ was a phantom. And that's why, was it first Peter that said, Peter or James, Peter, that said, anyone that denied the humanity of Christ is an antichrist. The humanity of Christ is as important as his deity. If you believe that Christ is God and fail to believe that Christ is human, completely human, with all the faculties and 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 the and the complement of what human beings are, is heresy. It means in his humanity, in his human nature, there are some things that limit him. He grew up like the way we grew up. He ate. I'm sure he went to the toilet, isn't it? You think so? He was hungry. He was tired. Can God be tired? The Bible says God can never sleep nor slumber, and God can never be weary. But we learned that Christ was tired and he slept. They almost drowned. Peter has to say, August, ah, ah, and he woke up like that. I mean, Christ was hungry. Can God be hungry? Christ, Christ cried, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. I mean, that's not God crying. So my God, my God, why are you forsaking me? He didn't even know why God has forsaken him. You see? And uh, uh, Christ. Uh, so this, this, this are, this, these are components of what it makes to be human. The writer of the gospel points to all of these things to show us that Christ is truly a man. Like us. With our limitations. But you can never, 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 never in one billion times think that Christ, the second person of the Trinity, is not aware of what the Father does. He said, all that is Father is mine, and all that is mine is the Father. There was never a time that God exists without Christ. Christ was not created a day after God came into existence. 
if God is without uh, beginning, Christ was never without beginning. If there was a time that was, there was no God, no, no, there was no time that there was no God. My mind, I can't even comprehend that. that. If there was a time that God was not, and God appeared on a Monday, he appeared as Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Should you understand that? So as a human being, he speaks like that. I'm not sure. What do you mean by two natures? God does not eat, and God does not die. Christ, did he die on the cross? Did he really die? Forever, did he die? Of course he died. Between knowing and dying, question is more impossible, test of God. Dying. Did he really die? Do you know why we recite the creed every Sunday? It was a big deal in early on. God died. This mystery all immortal dies. So all those things we see, they just, just happen out of out of the views. They came out of the church struggle to understand this thing. They did Athanasius, Augustine, they struggle with all of these things. That God really died. And there are some Christians that heard that no, if he's, if he's actually God, he didn't die. He pretended as if he died or he collapsed. I think Islam believed that. Yes, maybe somebody was swapped, or when he, when he was hanged on the tree, he disappeared. Some, something. But the idea that Christ actually gave up the ghost and died, no, people could not comprehend. And the idea of one person is that you're not going to say, oh, the divine, and there's another extreme you should not fall into. That's like the divine Christ, the human Christ. Having taken on the body, he is Christ. But it's having two natures in him. <laughs> I think that's how far I can go on this so that we can close for tonight. Okay. Uh, any any serious any serious question? Okay. No more serious question. Let me talk to you. Uh, fire okay. okay. Contribution. Yes, fire okay. Contribution. Use the microphone. The question. Do you want to ask question or contribution? <laughs> what is it? Yes. Okay. Let's do the online question and then. We'll okay. Go. He said, "But Jesus, in his humanity, on various occasions, exhibited omin sense." Yes. Why did Jesus answer that question, scooping from his? Divinity as he did. Which question? As he didn't. He just corrected himself. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why he answered the question. But it's, it's quite clear. You see, while he was there on earth, he, he continued to also teach the disciples that I'm, just, I'm not just a normal, I'm not just like, I'm also God. Both his humanity and deity were taught for three and a half years to the disciples. So that they will believe that he is the actual Messiah coming in the human form, in the human flesh. But he's also God. So those points where Christ showed his divinity is the, uh, the, the summary of what I can use as a summary. is a lot whole of theology around that is that the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit need, need deep. Let me be careful. Of course he's God, huh? Eh? And the Holy Spirit, his wife, his deity, that also can be a point of heresy if you stretch it too far. That he's, maybe at one point he's helpless as a man, and then the Holy Spirit will bring his deity to him so he can, he can perform and show his deity, and then the thing will go back again and hang somewhere. No, the guy is one person, two natures, two natures, one person, two natures, one person. So, and as God man, he chooses to display. What he wants to display at each time. He was never helpless at any point. Like, oh, I'm human, no, I'm trapped. There's, there's a movie like that, when you are so trapped. I think there's, a, there's a, this Mexican series that we ran in those days of AIT. One man that died. I don't know. Huh? 
This is the second chance. Hey! A lot of unbelievers are in this church. How old were you at that time? This was more than 10 years. Not even 10 years. She got that second. So the guy was so, the guy was trapped. What is his name? I don't know. That long hair in town. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So the guy was trapped. So Christ was not like trapped in his human body. And once in a while he, he the thing pop up and all that. So that's that's what you should understand about that. So yeah, Kevin, the last contribution. Um I was just um thinking about something about this not violating the human free will. Okay, so now uh people will ask uh, when bad things like evil people when they are doing evil like is you know, like um, God is actually allowing evil to happen. So I was just thinking, like, okay. Um, God is not just allowing it to happen. If he's allowing it, that's a simple thing to handle. Okay. Mm-hmm. So um, if we look at the way God dealt with the Is- Israelites, like, okay, when they go after other gods, God uses nations that are wicked, mm-hmm. even more than them, to deal with them. Yeah. And, um, okay, um, okay, uh, I'm just saying, like, why... God is not judging those nations at that moment. God is using those nations to, to uh, either punish or correct his children. So, like, I wanted to relate it to, like, um, uh, many times we are concerned about the evil of uh, what other people are doing, but um, God is more concerned about our own evil than the evil of unbelievers. Like, like even our own thoughts, our evil thoughts are weightier in sight of God than the murder that an unbeliever would mm-hmm. commit. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, by whose hand will we be? Um, we will be not punished now, but we will be chastised or or dealt with if there is no wicked people. I am just um, so. yes. Thank you for your contribution. My two points of application is this: why this all this whole thing that we're discussing? How does that matter? How does it matter to us now? First thing, it matters because of it teaches us about God that if you fear him. If God is this awesome and great and acts in this way so difficult for us to understand beyond our capacity to comprehend, you should fear him. I can't imagine a Christian doesn't fear God. Proverbs said, the fear of the Lord is the beginning, is a nursery school of wisdom. But fools despise wisdom. You should fear God. You know, in early days, when comedy has not come to the grade he has come now, the normal comedy that you grew up is called Zebrudaya. Zebrudaya and the, is it Greek, uh, Greek Gory, something like that. And Greek Gory. And then there will be, there will be cracking jokes. Fear the Lord, fear the Lord. And then Zed, you say, God, get on. Eh? God get on. God now mask will. But God get on. More than horn. The Bible says he's a consuming fire. I also spouse something one day. You see, even the very sin you commit, you, you cannot do it if God don't want to do it. There's not, you can't just be so strong and God is say, ah, I will catch this guy. He escaped my hand. No. Shambak. He said, if God went out looking for you, he will come back with you. If God come after you, he will get you. You should fear him. Second thing. This, this doctrine should comfort us in our communion with God. That God actually know both the actual and the possible. That from here to Kuali, if my car is going to break down, my car is going to bust, the car is going to some assault. God knows all of those things. And it helps us to pray. See, the first scripture we read in First Samuel chapter 3, David was in a fix and he, and he talked to God. And God answered him. He said, okay, don't. They are going to come down. See, it, it, it is when, that is the value of prayer. When we pray to God, even the minutest details of our life, God is interested. God is interested. Even the toothbrush, even the, the toothpaste, even the meal we are going to eat tonight, God is involved. That, that should comfort us. 
and help us to commune with God much more. He knows if God is silent, for instance, when David asked God about what they happened, God answered him. In the same place, Saul was asking God for, for and God refused to answer him because either God is angry with you because his, his ears are not deaf and his hands are not short, they cannot save. You should fear God and be and trust that you are in a constant healthy communion with him by the Holy Spirit through his son. That is one of the two points of application that you can take on uh, tonight. There is uh, a hymn I've said about what, 700 and something and then I'll ask for David to come and close the service in prayer. It's number 795. And after we sing this hymn, uh, Brother David will come to close the service. 795, have your way, O Lord, have your way. I am, you are the porter, and I am the clay. I mean, somebody was defending, one professor was defending this last, I was looking at one podcast, and the was saying, you see, Jeremiah 18, the Bible says, as God was molding the, the clay, the clay choose to spoil the, the, the clay, it's not God that spoiled the clay, it's the clay that spoiled by himself in the hand of God. So it's possible for believers to lose their salvation on their own. And all those, uh, it reminds me of that podcast, 795. How then, oh, we, oh Lord, you, uh, you are the potter, I am the clay. We sing the first uh, and, the, and the last, first and fourth. Yes. Yeah.